do that. Our next speaker today in the Russell 150 conference at the University of Bucharest is Mr. Matteo Baggio. Uh, he's a, a doctoral student at uh, the School of Advanced Studies Use in Pavia. And his talk is titled, What Logical Evidence Could Not Be. Matteo, thanks for being here and please take it away. Thank you. So I'll just uh, start sharing the screen. Can you see correctly the slides? Yes. Yeah, just one second because So uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you thank you very much uh, for, for being here. So uh, in today's talk, uh, I would like to discuss a little bit of some work that I've done recently on logical evidence. And in particular, uh, I, I would like to talk a little bit about what logical evidence could not be. So uh, the main reason why I think uh, people should focus on this uh, epistemological problem concerning logic is because by playing a crucial role in settling open issues in the philosophical debate about logical consequence and validity, evidence has become the holy grail of inquirers investigating the domain of logic. However, despite being indispensable in this sense, the notion of evidence has kept an aura of mystery. And in particular, there appears to be much confusion in conceiving the correct scope of this kind of uh, logical evidence. So in this talk, I will try to argue against some widespread conceptions of logical evidence. So although in the original paper I wrote for this topic, I considered uh, four main conceptions of evidence that are uh, now um, orthodoxy in uh, the epistemology of logic. And in this talk, I will focus only on two, uh, namely the debate between empiricists and apiarists about logic and the linguistic conception of logical evidence. And the main reason why I chose these topics is that they are broad and do not involve the technicalities that the other two conception would need. And so for reasons of efficacy, simplicity, and time, I'll stick to these two. But before getting into the heart of the matter, however, I think it might be interesting to introduce two Russellian adequacy constraints for an account of logical evidence and knowledge of logic. I will call them uh, Russellian adequacy constraints for logical evidence. And the motivation, of course, is to see whether Russell's idea about the epistemology of logic have survived and the changes that have taken place, uh, if it has survived with respect to the changes that have taken place in the last century. And therefore, uh, with respect to Russell, the aim will be twofold. On the one hand, I will try to understand whether Russell's thought on logic, uh, on logical evidence has served. And on the other one, I'll see if it needs to be uh, revised. So the first uh, Russellian adequacy condition that I'll introduce here comes, uh, concerns the first point of the debate that I will consider, and namely the dispute between empiricists or a posteriorists and apiarists about logic. So in a passage from uh, the chapter General Principles of the Problems of Philosophy, Russell writes, one of the great historic controversies in philosophy is the controversy between the two schools called respectively empiricists and rationalists. The empiricists maintain that all our knowledge is derived from experience, while the rationalists maintain that in addition to what we know by experience, there are certain innate ideas and innate principles which we know independently of experience. It has now become possible to decide with some confidence as to the truth or falsehood of these opposing schools. It must be admitted that logical principles are known to us and cannot be themselves proved by experience since all proofs presuppose them. 
So in this, therefore, which was the most important point of the controversy, the rationalists were right. But then uh, in, in the paragraph that follows, Russell adds something that is very interesting for me. And, and it is, on the other hand, even that part of our knowledge, which is logically independent of experience, is yet elicited and caused by experience. It, does, it is on occasion of particular experience that we become aware of the general uh, laws which their connection exemplify. This, while admitting that all knowledge is elicited and caused by experience, we shall nevertheless hold that some knowledge is a priori in the sense that the experiences which makes us think of it does not suffice to prove it, but merely directs our attention that we see its truth without requiring any proof from experience. So reading these passages, we could understand Russell's point of view in two different ways. Now, in a first sense, it could be argued that Russell endorsed a liberal conception of the epistemology of logic, and in particular one in which it seems like he intended the evidential grounds of logical knowledge to be both empirical and non-empirical. And secondly, and possibly a more apt uh, reading of this, these passages is that uh, Russell seems to benefit from the Kantian distinction between enabling and evidential experiences. So while the former type of experience is necessary only to grasp the relevant concepts involved in the claims we are considering, namely logical uh, claims, the latter type of experience is also needed to warrant these claims. And hence, I think in the second reading, it seems like the sensory experience are required only for logical understanding, but, play, but they do, don't play uh, any epistemic role. And so in the following, we will see which of these two really fit better uh, the contemporary debate. And the second uh, Russellian adequacy condition that I consider here regards the second conception of logical evidence, namely the linguistic conception of evidence. So in a passage from uh, the chapter descriptions from his introduction to mathematical philosophy, uh, Russell writes, for want of the apparatus of propositional functions, many logicians have been driven to the conclusion that there are and real objects. It is argued that we can speak about the golden mountain, the round square, and so on. We can make true propositions of which these are subjects, and hence they must have some kind of logical being. In such theories, it seems to me there is a failure of that feeling of for reality which ought to be preserved even in the most abstract studies. Logic, I should maintain, must no more admit a unicorn than zoology can logic is concerned with the real world just as zoology, though with its more abstract and general features. So to use an expression from Guy Lachère from the quotation we just read, Russell seems to take logic to be in the world. So by admitting that logic is concerned with the world just as zoology, Russell argues for a realism, I think, about uh, logic, like other, other philosophers of, it, of his time. See, for instance, uh, Frege and Wittgenstein, but later on also, I think Tarski and Quine endorsed uh, similar, yet diverse ideas. Um, therefore, Russell's conception of logic subject matter, and hence evidence, deviates from a conception where logic is more in the mind and language. And I think this passage is significant because, as we shall see, many philosophers of logic have taken an anti realist turn and adopted precisely a linguistic conception of logical evidence. And so we will see whether these ideas from Russell are still valid, uh, whether his conception of the subject matter of logic can inform the debate about logical evidence. So here is a, uh, an overview of what we are going to see today uh, during my talk. Uh, the talk can be divided uh, in three parts. In the first part, I'll just introduce you to the problem of uh, logical evidence, and then I'll move on to consider the two conceptions. First, the debate between a posteriorist and a priorist about logic, and then I'll see whether uh, the linguistic conception can hold. So about the problem of logical evidence, well, I think the problem of logical evidence is relevant because nowadays all sort of stances populate the philosophical debate about logic. 
So for instance, the monist and the pluralist debate as to whether logic, uh, the correct logic is one or many. So for instance, if classical logic is the one true logic or there are more uh, correct logics other than uh, classical logic. And on the other hand, uh, exceptionalists and anti-exceptionalists argue as to whether logic has a privileged status. And so uh, if it has a privileged status epistemically speaking, or, um, or also metaphysically speaking. And finally, the factualist and the non-factualist dispute as to whether it has a descriptive or a normative status. And what is more, as one might expect, most of these stances are related to one another in uh, various ways. But now suppose agents hold some logical theories and more specifically, they also hold some philosophical views about them. Uh, so in that case, I think these theoretical proposals, which agents hold, depend for their cogency on their proponents' belief that these do capture a practice that needs to be introduced or a phenomenon that needs to be described. But if these considerations are sound, we can see that the queries in which philosophers of logic are engaged are based on the possibility of gathering an intelligible epistemic intermediary that allows these inquiries to connect known facts about logic with the relevant phenomenon they're trying to seize. However, one might question, what could this intermediary be? So on a broad construction, evidence can be characterized as Chudnov uh, does as the set of considerations that epistemically count in favor or against you having certain beliefs. Beliefs are rationally held by virtue of evidence and as such constitute the epistemic basis of our propositional knowledge of reality. And so consequently, everything we allegedly know about logic depends on some compatible evidence. And inquiring into logical matters will intrinsically depend on evidence issues. And therefore the intermediary connection that I mentioned above, uh, which inquiries should investigate, will depend for answering the questions on uh, the nature of this uh, epistemic notion. There are two uh, remarks I would like to make before going on about the definition of evidence that I'm uh, using here. So the first one is that usually evidence is conceived as having a propositional nature. However, in the definition I gave above, um, this, uh, the definition seems to go beyond the scope. And as a matter of fact, I believe evidence can also have, um, could be also non-propositional, for instance, like perceptual evidence. This is because beliefs are not rationally held solely by virtue of propositional evidence. So for instance, in its raw form, perceptual evidence can be considered non-propositional. And yet it would be a mistake, I think, uh, to not count it as evidence. And especially uh, lately, this, pro this proposal has been mirrored also by proponents of the a priori. For instance, there is evidence for this in a paper in forthcoming by Lorenz Bonjour, but also others philosophers working in the philosophy of mathematics like uh, Toffoli have argued that the diagrams could account for a priori warrant and be known uh, proposition evidence. And, sec and the second remark that I would like to make is that uh, this conception of evidence is broad enough to include, although this conception is broad enough to include non-propositional evidence, the expression or uh, consideration in this definition should not imply that arguments like the one of Wright in uh, Wright 2004 or Bogosian blind reasoning. And so arguments concerning the constitutive nature of logical concepts or our natural life that should count as evidence. And the reason is that although these considerations could favor accepting the validity of logical rules, they would, I think, more aptly uh, support also the metapistemological claim that not all beliefs are evidentially held. And so they would be metapistemological, metapistemological, or meta evidential, if you wish. So, so far, I think many things have been said in the literature about the nature of logical evidence. And so consequently, many misunderstandings have their home in these queries. Uh, so the aim of this talk would be uh, to give a, get a negative analysis. And uh, we must note that 
for this reason is that the, the topic under consideration is undoubtedly vast. And we can register an increase of papers on these arguments, uh, at least since the emergence of the anti exceptionist stances have emerged in the philosophical debate about logic. And so many things that, uh, that have been said will not be addressed here. So for this reason, it will be a negative analysis. Uh, what I will try to do is I will try to remove some inadequate views on evidence from, my current, from, from the current debate. And hopefully by doing this, I will be able to uh, delineate a profile of evidence that will speak for validity and logical consequence. So as for the first, um, for the first account the, the, in the debate, the one between uh, a periodism and a posteriorism, I think it will be useful to put forward the two main epistemic stance in the, in the debate uh, from the beginning, and so explain them. And so we will start by looking at what a periodism and a posteriorism about logic could not be. So for starters, take uh, these quotations from uh, Martin 2020, uh, in describing these views, uh, uh, these apriorist views, uh, he writes, according to logical rationalism, we gain justification for our logical beliefs directly from intuitions regarding a particular proposition. We simply see that the proposition P is true or false. Indeed, for the logical rationalist, there is nothing else uh, the logician can appeal to. If another party disagrees with us, all we can do is suggest that our interlocutor is not having the right kind of intuitions. And similarly, for the semanticist, he writes, he, uh, the, the semanticist is in a similar position. According to her, we gain justification for our logical beliefs directly by grasping the meaning of logical propositions. Again, there is nothing other than the meaning of the proposition for the logician to appeal to. So logical rationalism and logical semanticism are the two main proposals in the upper stances about logic. And according to these views, as I, just, as I just said, logic can be considered exceptional in virtue of being priori oriented. However, although these views have the same purpose and that is to account for the priority of logic, they are radically different. Uh, while the former postulates the existence of a mental faculty that should allow us to direct uh, to have direct access to truth of various nature. The latter holds that certain claims can be uh, rationally held solely by understanding the propositional content of these statements. And so the former explains the acquisition of logical uh, evidence and warrants via an unmediated connection with the relevant subject matter. And in contrast, by elaborating on what understanding is, uh, the latter stance indirectly explains uh, warrant and evidence by postulating um, dispositional states. And, so, and hence, by exploiting these non experiential sources, these views account for, uh, represent the main alternatives to the empiricist stances in the epistemology of logic. And on the other hand, we have precisely empiricist stances, which hold that logical knowledge is a posteriori. And even though nowadays most proponents of this view would not follow Quine by endorsing all his pioneering in the ideas, it would be deceiving not to say that many of the new empiricist accounts that have been proposed lately have an enormously benefit from his radical legacy. And so one of, the, one of these uh, things that have been preserved nowadays is the claim that logical claims like all our, of our beliefs are indirectly warranted in a holistic spirit via our overall evidence. So traditionally, empiricism and apiritism about logic have always been considered uh, opposite foundational projects. However, uh, the way the debate is framed nowadays has changed. Specifically, although empiricism has preserved the idea that the epistemic status of the relevant claims that constitute, that constitute a domain of inquiry can only be a posteriori, it has also moved towards a less foundational conception of logical knowledge. And there is plenty of evidence for this in Hack, uh, Penelope Medi, but also Kila Sher. And conversely, while the foundational spirit of apiritism has been preserved, this view has benefited from 
a more relaxed conception of the evidential basis of the founding claims. So in other words, this means that uh, the epistemic roots, the basis of our uh, knowledge uh, can be worded in various ways. Moreover, uh, these changes in understanding these views between apriorism and empiricism are also accompanied by the departure from the idea that the foundational knowledge should entail certainty. This fact, of course, should be familiar to anyone familiar with Quine's empiricist teachings about the unlimited scope of revisability. But this period, I think, is also germane to all those apriorist stances that allow non-empirical sources to be both warranting and fallible. And evidence for this comes from uh, Donna Summerfield, uh, Lawrence Benjur, but also Biller. And so in discussing these two views about empiricism and apriorism, I will focus on these updated versions to be consistent with the contemporary debate. So generally speaking, then we can define empiricism uh, as follows, like in the definition E. Given a domain of inquiry D and a set S of claims about this domain, all the evidence that supports uh, the members of S is ultimately experiential. So in this picture, uh, we can see that knowledge can only be a posteriori, given that only experiential evidence is tolerated and only a posteriori knowledge is compatible with this, uh, with this evidence, the resulting knowledge will necessarily be a posteriori. However, more recently, uh, moderate empiricist stances like logical anti-exceptionalists have started to allow some a priori evidence to play a role in the epistemology of logic. And so evidence for this can be found in Russell, uh, Martin, and Martin in Portland, but also Grand Priest has something to say about this. Uh, nevertheless, by preserving uh, some of the Quine's, uh, Quine's teachings, like, as I said, a, modest, a modest version of epistemic holism. Uh, the proponents of this moderate stance will also argue that when non-experiential evidence enters the holistic framework, the overall evidence that warrants our logical theory is a posteriori. And so in other words, according to these uh, new views, knowledge in some domain D would still count as being a posteriori, for it is believed that what is held by mixed evidence receives an overall a posteriori warrant, like Kripke has told us, uh, has taught us in naming a necessity. So to see this point more clearly, we must consider uh, the following. Two general points characterize the anti-exceptionist -exception epistemology. And the first uh, is that we must readapt a motto from Williamson 2000 and say that most of the authors which are anti-exceptionist nowadays would endorse a theory first epistemology. And that is the evidence su supports entire logical theories and not individual claims taken in isolation. And there is plenty of evidence for this in the authors I mentioned above. And the second thing is that for these authors, logical knowledge is indirect. And hence the warranting process can only be inferential. Uh, Accordingly, since, uh, since the set S in E above represents a logical theory, S is warranted before its elements. And therefore the claims that constitute a logical theory receive the same kind of warrant as S. And hence, if warranting S is indispensable for warranting logical, uh, for is indispensable for warranting uh, single claims of S, there's no warranting a process that directly explains the epistemic status of the elements of S. And therefore the claims of S receive only one type of warrants, the one provided by S. On the other hand, given the assumptions that we made above, the theory S can be evidentially supported by both empirical and non-empirical evidence. However, since I said above, that empiricists and anti-exceptionists of this kind usually account for logical knowledge via some form of non-deductive inferential process uh, that is based among other things on a posteriori evidence, the overall warrant uh, will be empirical. And hence, there can only be one way of securing logical knowledge for anti-exceptionists, and that is by an inferential approach and an overall a posteriori evidential support. On the other hand, we can 
define apiarism as the negation of empiricism. And so we we'll take the definition A, given a domain of inquiry B and a set S of claims about this domain, not all the evidence to E that supports the number of S is ultimately experiential. So it is inter interesting to note that in this view, evidence has a twofold nature. It follows from A that evidence can derive either from experiential sources or it can arise from non-experiential sources. And this fact entails that apiarists can naturally endorse a sort of evidential pluralism. And moreover, given this uh, fact that this pluralism can be tolerated, different claims in B could be warranted by different types of, of evidence. And hence, the epistemic status of the claims in B could be heterogeneous, contrary to what is argued by the empiricist. I think this is a, a very desirable result. If S is a logical theory and its claims can be warranted in isolation, this could explain why different claims often receive various types of warrant. So for instance, one could argue that modus ponens is intuitively valid, so inferentially and a priori warranted. And conversely, one could argue that uh, we would need a different kind of uh, evidence for uh, and warrant for uh, warranting the rule of contraposition. And so this could be uh, a priori warranted if we needed proof, or it could also be a posteriori warranted if we needed uh, testimony or uh, evidence from testimony or from learning. However, I think uh, another interesting aspect of uh, what follows from the definition of, of a priori as I gave above is that in this uh, account, single claims could, could in principle be warranted by different types of evidence. So in the sense, if something could be a priori warranted, it could also be uh, posteriori warranted. And so if something could be grounded by non-experiential evidence, then it could also be grounded by experiential evidence. So this phenomenon is called uh, and has been called by uh, Albert Casullo epistemic overdetermination. And what is important to underline here is that it has been for a long time uh, underestimated. For example, take this quotation from Williamson who acknowledged this fact. He says, one may know that P both a priori and a posteriori if one knows it in several ways, some a priori, some a posteriori. Tradition has excluded that case on the grounds that only necessities are known a priori, whereas only contingencies are known a posteriori. But that was a mistake. So I think these considerations are important for two reasons. The first one is that empiricism, as it has, uh, as it has been defined above, cannot account for the phenomenon of epistemic overdetermination. As a matter of fact, from E, it follows that no non-empirical evidence could ever warrant some of our a posteriori beliefs. However, at least from bottom-up perspective, some claims seem to be intuitively held uh, independently of experience. Like, for instance, everything is self-identical. And consequently, since the latter epistemic fact needs to be accounted for, uh, the empiricist must either argue that the theoretical significance of, of the determination should be doubted or that the a priori posterior distinction is not natural or not theoretically uh, significant. And yet while attempts to pursue uh, these strategies have been undertaken, the positive outcome of these efforts uh, remains uncertain. In fact, on the one hand, uh, overdetermination seems to be widely accepted by rational agents and by uh, epistemologists. And on the other hand, uh, attempts to deny the naturalness of the theoretical significance of the a priori a posterior distinction has problematic evidence. Uh, there is plenty uh, of articles in forthcoming now on this. Uh, there's an article from Casullo and moreover also by Melis and Wright and also from Joshua Schechter. And the second point is that Martin's quotation seems to characterize this point uh, in the opposite way. His description of the a priorist views until that these stances can tolerate only evidence that is non-experientially, uh, can only tolerate evidence that is non-experiential. 
However, uh, we saw above that this seems quite the opposite of what the apriorist would, would hold. And that is that given that empirical evidence is tolerated in the apriorist picture, the advocate of this view would allow us uh, for some logical claims to be a posterior warranted. However, in virtue of, of that determination, it would also add that a priori evidence can independently warrant logic. And so in the ensuing picture, logic receives two types of support, one that is uh, experiential and one that is uh, non-experiential. So as a matter of fact, uh, contra to what is argued by Martin, uh, a priorists about logic are actually more tolerant than moderate empiricists. Uh, so the first moral to draw from this discussion some, from, comes, from, uh, comes with a new methodological principle that I should call the maximum of evidence maximization. And that is that an inquirer should keep as much evidence as possible in every cognitive domain. Now, if we take this maxim uh, as good as a good standing principle, we can use it to evaluate apriorism and empiricism about logic. And so, as we saw above, both parties in the debate accept that a priori evidence plays a role in warranting logic. However, we noticed that the, uh, what only one can account uh, could can coherently fit this kind of evidence in their framework, and that is um, a priorism. On the other hand, empiricism violates this maxim, and thus we should reject it or consider it incomplete. But furthermore, in light of the maxim that I proposed above and the considerations that I made so far about the nature of apriorism, if these anti-exceptionists were to stick to their guns uh, and allow for some non-experiential evidence to support logical knowledge, uh, they would be proposing actually an epistemology that is consistent with the apriorist stances. And hence, contra to their acquiring heritage, there would be, uh, there would be considered a special case of logical uh, apriorism. So now moving on to the second conception of logical evidence. Uh, this second type of conception of logical evidence concerns more directly the nature of logical evidence. Uh, so many prominent philosophers working in the philosophy of logic have argued that fundamental logical notions should be read out of language. And there is plenty of evidence for, for this in authors like Ayer, Montague, uh, Bieland, and Frassen, but also Priest lately has accounted for this. Accordingly, this linguistic conception of evidence can be motivated by considering that most of these authors, uh, which are usually monists about logic, entail a form of uh, linguistic telic monism, and that is that there is only one philosophical primary or canonical application of logic. And there is plenty of evidence for this, uh, for this conception of telecommonies in the literature. So for instance, take what um, Grand Priest says in his article from 2016. And just as with geometries, pure logic have a canonical application, that is deductive reasoning, a logic, with its canonical application delivers an account of ordinary reasoning. One should note that ordinary reasoning, even in science and in mathematics, is not carried out in formal language, but in the vernacular. And so in other words, the pure logic with its canonical application is a theory of validity of ordinary arguments. What deductively follows from what? And other evidence comes from also by Eron Kotmoir, who argues, what do logic represents? It is clear from the various use of applied logic, they can represent many different sorts of phenomena. But for the purpose of traditional logic though, theories of consequence are frequently taken to represent natural language inference. So let's suppose with these authors that uh, endorse a version of telic, uh, linguistic telic monism, and, and so in that sense, I think that facts about syntax and language, but also use for them, should be the primary uh, focus of logical theorizing. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, textbook definitions of logic take this discipline to study the correct reasoning or good arguments. 
And now, since it could be argued that these arguments always occur in some languages, we should inspect the intrinsic features of the latter to gather evidence for logical theorizing. However, recently numerous uh, challenges have questioned this widespread conception. And so uh, by considering uh, some case studies like the ones that we will consider in a second, I will show that the prospects of this hypothesis are untenable. So a first reason to resist this conception uh, comes from uh, Glansberg 2015. Uh, in this article, he challenges the primacy of the natural language thesis, and that is the connection between the formal logical consequence relation and its informal counterpart in natural language. In, in this article, he contends that uh, what we find in natural language is something like logical consequence only if we drastically abstract and idealize away from natural language. However, importantly, Glansberg here does not go as far as saying that no application of logical methods to natural language can be of any use because clearly there has been great success in the application. However, Glansberg writes, the two sets of facts are fundamentally autonomous. And to account for this, he argues that, uh, he argues that linguistic and logical semantical analysis go amiss for him. In fact, while the former, the linguistic semantical analysis is interested in explaining how words get their meaning, the latter, the logical semantical analysis, uh, focuses on formal inferential links between logic, logical consequence uh, bearers that contain logical vocabulary. And so in this second semantical analysis is concerned more with assessing the inferential connections uh, irrespective of actual means apart from, of course, uh, logical, uh, logical And the second uh, way to resist uh, the linguistic conception of logical evidence has been proposed by Bogdan Discher. In this article from uh, 2021, he has argued that the menace of logical nihilism seems to be invited by the contiguity between the generality thesis uh, and the privileged application of logic to the natural language. So, for those of you who are not acquainted with the generality thesis, this thesis holds that a valid inference schema holds unrestrictedly on some standard conception of logical consequence. And so depending on one's preferred account of validity, an argument is said to be valid if and only if, in every case in which the premises have a designated value, so does the conclusion. So for instance, uh, allegedly valid rules of inference like modus ponens should hold in all circumstances. And so in this reading, every time we coherently substitute the meta variables of MP uh, with some claims uh, from the domain we are investigating, then if the claims that constitute the premises are, say, true, uh, the conclusion will also be true. However, uh, Dischel argues that given the breadth and nuances of language, we could, in principle, always find a way to invalidate uh, some valid uh, schemata. So, for instance, I think one apt illustration of the present case would be uh, that what the initial has in mind would be uh, make these counter examples to uh, modus ponens validity. So, in 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 McGee's counter examples, proceed by showing that by implementing the meta variables of this rule with some peculiar claims one would be warranted in holding the premises where, without thereby holding uh, the conclusion and hence by, and so invalidating most points. As I hinted uh, in what I just said, one interpretation of this failure can be attributed to the peculiar features of the claims and maybe uses to instantiate uh, the schema, and namely the fact that the uh, conditional premise has the consequent of this condition that is itself a condition. And so some, some in the case of modus points. However, I think what is more important is another doubtful conjecture is the hidden assumption that the expressions if then always behave as material conditions. And so in other words, an inference validity depends on the natural language intrinsic logical features. 
Hence, it would follow from this that uh, every coherent linguistic instantiation of the meta variables of modus ponens should be evidence for the logicality of an inference schema. However, both uh, these assumptions should be doubted, and this is what also Dischel would argue. Uh, for once, uh, the, extensive, the extensive studies on indicative conditionals have shown that these expressions do not always behave as, uh, in a truth functional way. But more importantly, I think the idea uh, that every coherent substitution can be used as evidence for counter evidence for the validity of a logical principle is also suspicious. As Discher argues, uh, this assumption depends on the idea that any preliminary tidying up of the relevant cases that could count as evidence or counter evidence for a logical rule could be had. And to explain this latter po more point more clearly, Discher uh, takes uh, Frege's metaphor of the eye and the microscope and comments that details aside, the overarching idea is precisely that of containing the multitude of phenomena that occur in natural language to a sufficient degree to make possible the study of the general laws of thought. So it is relative to this purged medium that the, general, the generality of logic is predicated. And so we can draw some conclusion from these two uh, arguments that have been proposed against the linguistic conception of logical evidence. The first that is that if language has to be used as evidence for logical knowledge, then on the one hand, it needs to be idealized and abstracted as Glansberg says, but also on the other hand, it also needs to be regulated to, a secret, to circumscribe the cases that should count as relevant evidence. And so this purged medium, which Tischer uh, uh, argues about, is basically, uh, he's basically saying that we need a principled way to uh, purge language from uh, bad, bad evidence. But this cannot be intrinsic to language. And the last, the last one that I will consider uh, is, uh, the last counter evidence against the linguistic conception of logical evidence is the one that comes from, uh, it would, is the one that tackles the privilege application of, of uh, logic to natural language. So Eklund and Commandeur have shown that there is a generality, uh, a, a, sorry, a genuine plurality of purposes that can be at our disposal when we characterize logical operators. And so, for instance, Eklund argues that. When focusing on language, there are three independent linguistic projects that could motivate logical theorizing in a pluralistic setting. And specifically uh, from the bad paradoxical evidence emerging from natural language, one could embark on one of the following projects to construct logical theories. So the first project is the mapping project and which involves identifying the expressive limitations of various possible languages. And so this would translate in the case of logic to explain uh, and see how the notion of validity would behave in different possible languages. Second project uh, is the one of the actual language project, which involves in figuring out how our natural language behaves with respect to what we are investigating. And so in the case of logic, we will see how a logical consequence would behave in natural language. But there is also another project, which is the norm normative project. And this aims to find what our best language would be like. And so again, this would translate to the case of hand in figuring out, in figuring out what is the best notion of logical consequence. But given uh, the fact that it could give rise to pluralism or monism about logic, uh, the fact is that the important fact to underline here, here is that given the overall cogency of these projects, if one were to focus merely on language and argue that logic should be read out of it, one would have to recognize that we could engage in three equally interesting projects that stand independently of each other's in terms of priority. So I don't think I'll have time to see the last part, but let me just say uh, one last thing about the linguistic conception of logical evidence. And that is that the, all the arguments that uh, we've seen so far seems to suggest that we should be careful when we take facts about that natural language as evidence for logical claims. And more generally, uh, we should uh, 
CD seem to speak up against the idea that there is a privileged evidential informant for uh, facts and knowledge. So concluding, uh, so I started this, uh, this talk by assuming that everything we know about logic depends on facts about logical evidence. However, from the discussion presented in the previous section, nothing seems to, uh, seems to work. However, I think we should not despair uh, because I think there is a viable option that we could, uh, we could, we could use. However, uh, the name of this talk was what well, logical evidence could it be? And so I will not try to um, put forward this uh, positive analysis. And moreover, at the beginning, I introduced two Russellian adequacy conditions for logical evidence, and I think now it's time to evaluate them. The first one prescribed that uh, an account of logical evidence should consider both a priori and a posteriori evidence, uh, which played the role in secure logical knowledge. And the second one prescribed that logic should be about the world. So with regards to the first one, I think Russell was right, but we should take the last uh, the less stringent interpretation of uh, the passages from the problems of philosophy. And specifically, we should abandon the idea that uh, we, should, we should think that his ideas should be revised. And in this sense, we should take the more, the more liberal one, which is consistent with uh, the actual results that I presented today. And with regards to the, to the second one, I think that Russell was right and that logic should be about the world. And I think my arguments against the linguistic conception of logical evidence uh, have, have, try, have tried to show this. And so although the outcome of this talk contrasts with the, mass, the vast majorities of the accounts in the literature, I think it seems to me to be fine green enough to settle the queries that meant fundamental logical notions. And hence, uh, I think to build a coherent account that fits with the available data, we should proceed with our inquiry on evidence uh, from this workable uh, background. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Baggio and everyone in the audience joined me in uh, commending your talk. If there are some questions now. Uh, Jim, please go ahead. Well, you uh, were talking about the resources available to the uh, a priorist and the a posteriorist. Perhaps I'm not summarizing accurately. Yeah, yes, uh, my, my, my first part was, I, was about the debate between a priorist and a posteriorist about logic. But you're discussing debate between these positions. I yes. say you're discussing debates between these positions. And at any rate, I noticed a certain a prioriism in your approach, and it's a common one. That is, uh, you don't need to hear the debates. You talk about the resources of the sides in a general way. Now, I would say that when you uh, have debates, say about the law of excluded middle or the like, it's really important to be there. and. It's always possible that there will be very surprising things said on either side. I mean, this is something you can't be a priori about. It's something that depends on the particular discussions. And I noticed you, you mentioned I, you mentioned Klein as an example of a liberal on, on the status of logical laws. And I, I am, I've always been amused. I can't actually cite the chapter and verse right now, but he, he does definitely say he's discussing the law of excluded middle. And he says, these are matters over which we can profitably maintain control. That's pretty much an exact quote, which is very uh, much a corrective to the spirit uh, of you know, open-mindedness about uh, what people might think. The idea would be that in, in some of his remarks, we would consider uh, you know, if there was a popular move away from the law of the middle, all right. But in this remark, he is saying that as teachers, we would need to correct this. And uh, it would be profitable for us to see to it that it doesn't get out of hand. At any rate, my main point, if I have any at all, is just that 
one can't be a priori about the kind of ideas that can be advanced in defense of these uh, views we were discussing. Okay, so um, if, I, if I got your point, you're, you're saying that we cannot settle the debate from a, a priori point of view. Is this, is this right? Uh, say again, please. I think I, th I think what I got from your your uh, overall uh, suggestion or question is that we cannot settle the debate between these two uh, parties in an appropriate way. Is, is this is this your question? Well, we could do this in our own discussion if, for example, someone had a position here about the laws. They would take trouble, and we would come to an agreement about what law they had in mind. And then we would hear what they had to say for it. And we could then come to a decision among ourselves about who we agreed with and our verdict. And I think what I'm saying here, I, I believe some people find frighteningly uh, anti-general and uh, think that it would be quite a terrible thing for our subject if we were uh, cut off from these uh, general approaches. But anyway, that's my, my uh, theme. Uh, it's, I, think, I, think it, I think it's a fair point. Uh, just, uh, just consider the fact that now what is called uh, anti exceptionism about logic is uh, it's very, a very broad church, and everyone has uh, their say in what uh, the status of logic uh, in terms of both epistemologically and metaphysically is completely different. So. Uh, I don't know, someone like Williamson would say like uh, nothing, there, there's no philosophical uh, important feature of logic which we should keep apart in some places where he seems to say that generality uh, should hold. But uh, there are other proponents which have changed their mind. For instance, like uh, Ole Hjortland uh, who started out as an observist about logic and now he seems to have changed his mind about these regards. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a broad spectrum to investigate. And of course, everyone has uh, their views about uh, the status of the laws. You should keep in mind that what empiricists uh, I think want to discuss is not uh, uh, the, um, the epistemic status of the logical laws in particular, but of logical theories taken as a whole. So uh, in, in, in this sense, I think it's- Yeah, it, it may well be that everyone has their views and there's approximately 8 billion of us. But I would say that if you were to come on and say, here's this law, and we would come to an agreement as to what you meant, and then you'd say, I think it's true, or I think it's false, or the like. We would make a different sort of progress. And this would be uh, more directly uh, dialectical. And uh, nowadays in philosophy, we are uh, condemned to extreme generality. And uh, we aren't usually talking with each other, uh, but we're talking about what people would say if they were to do so. And uh, this is considerably uh, less. N never mind, it's different. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for your question, anyways. Yeah. Thanks so much to both for the exchange. And I wonder if there's some more questions, comments, or joiners. Could I maybe insert a brief question of my own? Uh, you might have approached this during your talk, and I might have missed it. I'm sure I did, uh, but um, uh, when you discussed the relationship between logic and language, um, there was, um, I mean, your, your uh, discussion is geared to uh, approach logical evidence, uh, but there it seemed as though the issue pertained to information rather than evidence. So is there a separate step there to be made uh, concerning which information could be evidentially relevant or evidentially compulsory, or it could count as possibly evidential, or? I, I, I think I missed because I had 
uh, slight uh, left the signal for it. Like, could you go over the question again? Yes, um, I was really um, um, sort of asking this, uh, starting from one of your slides in one of the logic the language, uh, so that, right in that section. And there, uh, it seemed as though the issue pertained rather to which information we could gear. Um, and and this, this seemed to inform one of the constraints you were discussing from Russell. Uh, and I was just wondering exactly what the step there is from uh, ascertaining which information could be gotten and ascertaining its possible evidential status, right? Um, so I was wondering if there is a distinction to be made in, in the kind of uh, debates that you're anchoring uh, in or whether this is perhaps imported from a different kind of literature. Okay. Uh, let, let me try to summarize the question before answering. Uh, are, are you uh, alluding maybe to the distinction between like uh, data and evidence for, for logic? Well, I mean, like asking if there is, a, a, if this, if it's different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, typically, when information comes to have a, a relevant evidential uh, role, uh, yeah. well, so focusing only on language, uh, what I what I wish to say uh, about this is that. I, I, I don't think that language cannot be um, uh, evidence for, for can, cannot display or exhibit evidence for, um, for, for logic. However, if, if I were to take one of the arguments I proposed for, uh, for, for, for the conception of, uh, against logical evidence it is the one of Disha who argues for a very uh, fine grained fine -grain point and that is, uh, language represents a, a set of information which can uh, very bro broadly account for uh, for counting in favor of, of, of logic. But we cannot take everything for, uh, we, can, we, we cannot take all this information to be evidence for logic. We need a way to uh, purge this kind of information uh, from, the, from th those kinds of things that would clearly go against uh, the, the generality of logic that we want to account for. Because of course we can always find a way to invalidate uh, and show that a logical rule can fail if we use uh, evidence from language. So in, in this sense, we need a principal way to uh, to move away from what counts as only information to what is evidence or logic in language. And, uh, but the point I wanted to make is precisely that this cannot be intrinsic to language. We cannot use language to uh, move away from all this information, uh, to, to, to move away or to purge language from this kind of information. And so this kind of, it's kind of principal way that we need to uh, move towards uh, a conception of logical evidence must be external to language. And then there's the big question of what could, uh, what could this be? But I would try not to, to not speak in favor of anything right now. All right, thanks so much for, for the answer. Uh, if there are some more questions, comments, and if not, please join me in thanking Mr. Baggio once again for, for his talk. Thank you.